part two is uh, uh, it's all about the patience. It's all about the patience, the patience. Uh, Bob Blaskowitz uh, appears on the live web show, Virtual Skeptics. Be sure to check that out. That's every week. Uh, yes, Virtual Skeptics. Awesome. He also writes, of course, for Swift Blog. Uh, here is his haiku. Uh, so just like I said, here's part two of this lecture. There is no part three. There we go. Please welcome Bob Blaskowitz. How are you doing? Uh, in uh, November 2011, uh, Stanislaw Brzezinski uh, came to the attention of skeptics when a representative of his clinic, uh, a guy by the name of Mark Stevens, sent pseudo-legal threats to bloggers around the world who were critical of the clinic, including Reese Morgan, uh, who doesn't tolerate that type of stuff. Um, Stevens had been hired, according to the clinic, to provide web optimization services. Uh, he was fired when this particular optimization tactic blew, black, blew back in the clinic's face, though Brzezinski never retracted the, the promise of legal threats. Um, when I read about Brzezinski at the time, I realized that I'd come across him before. Um, over a decade ago, a friend of mine whose son was dying of a brain tumor uh, had asked me about a doctor out west who treated people with a substance isolated from urine. I looked at it for her and had to tell her that he was probably a quack. Since then, I had forgotten the doctor's name, but I never forgave the person who made me break my friend's heart. When Reese and the other bloggers were threatened, um, I looked through news databases uh, for references to Brzezinski in the popular press. I found stories of over a dozen desperate patients around the world raising vast sums of money from their communities to go to Brzezinski's Houston Clinic for his unproven treatment. In my first blog post about Brzezinski, uh, I reported that out of the 17 patients I could find outcomes for in the press or online, 16 of them were dead. Uh, further searches uncovered more patients and more deaths, and at some point, hunting down information about Brzezinski's patients, and, and through them what goes on inside the clinic became what I did in my spare time. Um, as I got increasingly interested in the story, I learned a lot about how patients become convinced that the Brzezinski clinic might have something for them. I'm surprised and depressed. Uh, by how many people point to Suzanne Summers' book as an authority. Um, in recent years, ever since it was uh, featured on Dr. Oz's radio show, a lot of people report, yeah, uh, a, a lot of people report being, report being convinced by Eric Marola's utterly credulous patient exploitation film, Brzezinski Cancer is a Serious Business. He named it apparently without irony. Yeah, um, but I think the most persuasive pitch comes from his former patients, the ones who happen to have lived. Um, the clinic itself appears to use these patients as uh, ambassadors, collecting and distributing the names of current and former patients who'd be willing to promote the clinic. This is a, a list of pancreatic cancer patients given to a prospective client. Um, and you can see that in the comments column at the far right, maybe you can't see, um, uh, the patients appear to have indicated they're willing to either talk to prospective patients, to appear on the website, uh, or to talk to the media. I followed, I followed up on the patients listed here. Um, at the time this list was given to the prospective patient, uh, Joseph was alive, but he died well within the normal life expectancy given his diagnosis. Joanne, too, was alive, but she was dead within a year of, of starting therapy. Irene S. would be dead within the month. And when my friend got this list, Maxine was already dead. Patients who have survived Brzezinski's treatment understandably, understandably mobilized to promote him, but a cult of personality surrounds him like nothing I've ever seen. Some of his for and current, uh, former and current patients run the Brzezinski Patient Group website, which offers a ready supply of not just overly optimistic, but almost completely uncritical stories. To an end-stage cancer patient, um, or somebody with a dying child who hasn't had good news for months. The stories seem to point to a way out, and they invariably point to a cure. Um, and for, you know, for a, pati a patient who, or a, a parent whose kid has cancer, anything less than that kid living in a, a normal life is going to be seen as a failure. So they have to take, you know, they have to take that leap. Uh, this glaring hope uh, of the Brzezinski patient group not only blinds patients to the reality of their prospects at the clinic, but also to the many gradations of a successful treatment, from delaying the progression of disease to palliative care and relief of pain. 
uh, this mass of glowing endorsement was un uh, endorsements was until recently unmatched by any sort of sustained critical commentary by former patients. And I suspect that's because the people who would have written it are all dead. Actually, and this is a ripe little slice of hell, um, the version of the Brzezinski patient group website that was up when Reese Morgan was threatened in 2011, you see it at the left, um, it had 103 patients as members. Um, as of mid-June, there were only 63, and 17 of those were on the very original site way back in 1999, which is about three patients added per year. Now, you can't assume that the role of names correlates directly to his success rate, um, but it's not the steadily growing fan club that we expect from someone who's doing miraculous things for cancer patients. So, uh, we skeptics have taken it upon ourselves to give a voice to the patients Brzezinski has unquestionably failed. And to do that, we established the other Brzezinski patient group. Here we... <laughs> Here we gather the stories that have been left by patients online, in forums, on Facebook, on their personal web pages and blogs, in the media, in databases, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Every bit of information we've posted was publicly available to anyone with the time to find it, and we've linked to all the original sources. So you can compare our interpretation to what the patients originally said. You know, we're, we're not afraid to bring the evidence. Um, these stories weren't meant to be evidence one way or the other about the efficacy of the treatment. It is and always has been Brzezinski's job to provide that evidence. These stories were meant to be visceral, persuasive reminders that this is not a miracle cure. We have about 50 patient stories written up right now, which is, a, which is less than one-tenth of the total number of patient names we've been able to gather. As the number of completed stories grew, our website became something I don't think we anticipated. Um, we realized that there was a lot more to the story than just unproven chemotherapy as we followed the case of Amelia S. Um, as it unfolded online, um, her father wrote numerous detailed accounts of what the family was going through, and the British media followed her story closely for months, giving Brzezinski a lot of unearned publicity in the UK. In November 2011, I a, sent a note to, to Dr. Gorski uh, about an ecstatic update that Amelia's father had posted on the Amelia's Miracle Facebook page, in which he indicated that the Brzezinski Clinic felt that a cyst was forming inside of the tumor, and this meant the tumor was dying. I had no idea what to make of this. Um, I thought that, you know, that it seemed weird. Could I have been wrong? Um, from the outside, it sure looked like the treatment was working. And Dr. Gorski's reply was that while it was possible uh, that a tumor might break up like that from the inside, that the pattern was far more, far more typical of a tumor that had outgrown its blood supply. When Amelia's physicians in the UK examined the same MRI, they agreed with this interpretation. If this had just been an isolated case, you could think that maybe Amelia's father just went with the possibility he liked more, you know, the interpretation he liked more. Um, but going through the stories, out of the first 50 patients or so that we've looked at, no fewer than seven excitedly reported that their tumors were breaking up in the middle, including all of these children here. Um, and the story of the boy at the upper right, Chase, uh, is the worst thing I've ever had to write. Um, and even Brzezinski is a minor player in the predatory uh, uh, alternative medicine world that, uh, as it applies to, sh uh, to, to uh, Chase. It's a horrible thing. Uh, one such child, Cody, appeared in his local paper um, and who, who reported, quote, after two visits, visits to the Brzezinski Clinic and around-the-clock treatment for almost six weeks, his parents say a recent MRI shows the tumor has not grown and its core appears to be breaking up. Cody has limited movement on his left side because a treatment sometimes causes the tumor to swell, putting pressure on the brain stem his parents said. This was 20 years ago, in 1994. And again, this is just seven out of the first 50. When you consider that this client, David, reported that Brzezinski has treated at least 8,000 patients by now, you'll understand the sense of urgency behind the recent Brzezinski campaign. David and I, uh, uh, this client uh, had an exchange on one of my websites, which he mentions in the video, and at the time his wife, Janet, was going through treatment for ovarian cancer. 
her uh, oncologist had given her three and a half to five years maybe on standard treatment and they said that wasn't enough. Uh, a year after our exchange, Janet's now dead. Uh, I should point out that once we linked to this video, the guy who filmed the interview, a supporter by the name of Pete, a very uh, vocal supporter by the name of Pete, uh, took the video down, essentially throwing Janet's story into a memory hole, which I find difficult to excuse. The optimistic prognosis given to probable ischemic necrosis, that actually kind of bounced along, um, in MRIs is just one facet of a larger pattern in the stories by patients and their families. They frequently report um, that getting worse is a sign of getting better. Uh, for instance, one 13-year-old patient named Rory vomited after starting treatment. The family reported that their nurse, Marlene, quote, explained that as the antineoplastins turn off the cancer cells, they die, and the white blood cells rush to the area to clear out the dead cells. This causes swelling, which can cause the vomiting. Uh, she said, as unpleasant as it can be, it's actually a good thing. Rory died in 2005. The family of Supatra, and that's the chest port that they, they installed to administer this treatment, um, who had a, a brainstem tumor, reported, uh, quote, we were told last Wednesday that as the antineoplastins work to kill the tumor cells, it is normal for the brain tissue to swell with all the dead cells in there. This swelling is what creates the pressure and results in headaches and vomiting. If this is the explanation that patients are being given, it's a side effect of the treatment that does not appear on this recent informed consent form that every A&P patient signs. Swelling is listed as a possible side effect under most commonly occurring side effects and has a reported frequency of 2%. And it's likely related to the enormous sodium load that a, uh, Brzezinski's A&P patients carry. You would think that the tumor encroaching upon your damn brainstem getting bigger would be listed as a serious side effect. Um, but yeah, so what are, what, are these, uh, what are these nurses talking about? Patients deserve to have questions like this. Basic questions answered. An especially egregious case of getting worse being interpreted as a sign of getting better appeared in the U.S. News and World Report. Andrea's family reported that she was given a 30% chance of recovery uh, by the clinic for her glioblastoma, another brain tumor. Uh, when Andrea experienced strong side effects, her mother, her mother said the nurses were jubilant. Uh, quote, they said this side effect was a sign the tumor was breaking up. After the tumor doubled in size over the next few weeks, Andrea flew down to Houston with a friend who was a nurse. They were reportedly told the tumor was dissolving and that Andrea would be going back to work soon. So the family put another $7,000 on their credit card for a month of treatment. What happened next was reported in the magazine, quote, Andrea died on the airplane home on October 1st, her luggage full of antineoplastins. According to the FDA patient report, Andrea uh, quote, did not die under Brzezinski's care. She is listed as having withdrawn from treatment on September 30th, two days before she died. I stress again, her family reported that her suitcase was full of antineoplastins. Um, two and a half years later, her parents reported they were still paying off Brzezinski's bill. And speaking of billing, uh, the treatments are not free. The most recent prices I've seen for starting antineoplastin therapy range between twenty dollars to $30,000 down payment and something on the order of $7,500 per month for treatment every, you know, every month thereafter. On Supatra's website, her father claimed that innumerable little fees were silently tacked on until one day he learned that despite his down payment, that he was $4,000 in debt to the clinic and warned future patients to be careful. Another patient, Kathy, visited the clinic for treatment of breast cancer, expecting to be put on antineoplastins, or hoping to be. Uh, she made it clear to the staff in videos she took that she did not want traditional chemotherapy. The gene-targeted therapy uh, seems to be off-label standard chemotherapy, um, and she didn't want any standard chemotherapy. At any point, anybody working in the clinic, anyone who had answered the phone um, or had talked to her, uh, could have told her that she was not going to be eligible for the treatment that she wanted. Anyone like uh, Greg Brzezinski, uh, Stan's son and heir apparent, uh, who she filmed a, a, a session with, could have told her she was ineligible for antineoplastins because she did not have brain cancer. And so after her trip to Houston, she posted uh, this on YouTube. Uh, and underneath there it says, uh, 
I made this video in anticipation that I'd be receiving antineoplastins. Apparently, after spending over $30,000 here, I found out that the antineoplastins are only reserved for brain cancer patients who have already undergone chemo and radiation. Using the black salve is the only thing left for me to do. And that's a, a highly corrosive, nasty thing that she's going to. Lastly, and this one, act, this one really upsets me, is the story of Denise D., another breast cancer patient with, met, with metastasis. Uh, she was working full-time while in treatment. She was uninsured. Um, she was on the chemo cocktail route, and she was getting all of her off-label drugs with patient assistance from the drug companies. Nonetheless, she reported the clinic was going to charge her $1,500 a month to receive and hold on to her monthly supply of one drug. Her vision of the confrontation with the billing representative is chilling. Um, when I talked with Barbara T., the financial manager at the Brzezinski Clinic, and told her that the charge of $1,000 per infusion and an additional $1,500 a month to handle the three small vials of Zameda was just more than I could afford, she told me, well, we have to survive here. You want to see Stan just barely scraping by? Andy Lewis found a picture of the, well, you can't actually see the house. It's, there's a gate there. Um, it's a 10-acre, 15,000-square-foot, $6 million residence with 15 bathrooms, saunas, and swimming pools. Uh, that's an electronic gate with his gilded initials. A guy has to survive, I guess. So far, Brzezinski has, has beaten the system. The FDA has failed to protect these patients. The justice system has failed these patients. The Texas Medical Board, so far, has been unable to protect these most vulnerable patients. So who's left to stand for them? And I think it's us. I think it's skeptics. We may not be able to fill the professional or legal roles of these authorities, but we can educate about the public about the form of quackery being practiced in Houston. In the last year or so, I think that the continued and increasing skeptical attention to this issue has made a great deal of difference in the national coverage of Brzezinski and hopefully in the prospects for patients. Skeptics who have public, publicly criticized Brzezinski have received communications from dissatisfied patients and their families. We've put them in touch with the media, regulatory officials, legal representation, and each other. Skeptics have taken it upon ourselves to jump in and offer what we have found to people who praise or recommend Brzezinski on the Brzezinski hashtag on Twitter. Uh, when newspapers or media report uncritically on Brzezinski or on patient fundraisers to see him, we make sure that editors are contacted. And lastly, when somebody is fully committed to going to the clinic, it's useless and distressing, honestly. They have a lot on their plate to try to dissuade them from going. Um, so instead, we put together a tip sheet about how to protect yourselves if you do go to the Brzezinski Clinic. Tips like uh, make sure that you get an itemized bill every day. Make sure that you let them know that you're making an audio recording of everything that's being said. Those of us who are working on this case have a couple of projects in the pipeline. And if we pull them off, I think they'll be big. Um, I think you'll be surprised. And I'll actually kind of be surprised too. Um, but when we deliver these mighty, carefully aimed blows, we're going to need your help. The, the help of the entire skeptical community to make the impact as big as possible and light as many fires under his butt as we can. This is not the type of case, I think, where we can be half in because the people who perpetuate this will not be. Um, a lot of the people who support Brzezinski believe that their lives literally depend on fighting for him, that we are trying to kill them. A few examples of what they've done so far. Well, there have been um, some tickle fights on Twitter um, yeah. Uh, the clinic's man, Stevens, not only harassed dis, uh, dissatisfied, uh, critical bloggers, but also harassed uh, dissatisfied former patients, uh, including Wayne and Lisa Marie Merritt, um, threatening them with legal action, calling them at home. Um, Wayne is still ill with, with pancreatic cancer, by the way, and he's doing well. Um, uh, in the, the spring of 2012, a website went up uh, defaming skeptics critical of Brzezinski as pedophiles. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to point out here that I'm being defamed, I'm at the bottom, I'm being defamed alongside Stephen Fry and Simon Singh. Best defamation ever. But still, I've been labeled a necrophiliac, you know. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, Dr. Gorski talked about this, but his, his medical board has been contacted by patients. 
Um, well, the director of the Brzezinski movies wrote to the chancellor of the university where I'd just been hired, citing the virtual skeptics web show that I do with some friends. He misrepresented me to my new employer and asked them to comment about my, quote, extracurricular activities. The filmmaker then, after basically uh, promising to, to smear me while linking me to my employer in millions of homes, honestly making me fear that I might, you know, receive death threats or, God forbid, my family might receive death threats. Um, after he did that, he, he seemed to have pulled the punch and included footage in his, his movie that looked like this. Um, ultimately, the video that he used in his movie was so dishonestly and deceptively edited, I have a feeling that his lawyer told him to wipe all identifiers. Or, you know, maybe he just wanted to terrorize skeptics. So how can you help? Um, we have an action alert uh, sign-up sheet out at the IIG table, and I'm asking you to go over and, and to sign up. Um, ask for your name and your email address. Um, I would only use this when something big is happening, um, so you won't get spammed. I'll send out maybe a confirmation email after TAM. Um, but I'm going to ask for 10 minutes of your time at some point over the next four months. Um, I'm asking for a commitment to help correct some of what we have seen here. So please sign up at the IAG table, and I, I promise you we'll find something awesome for you to do. Um, I'd like to close, you know, kind of where I started, kind of back at my title. The title of the talk comes from the cover of the book, um, this book right here. Um, there it is. Uh, it's Galileo's Lawyer, or yeah, Galileo's Lawyer, by Brzezinski's lawyer, Rick Jaffe. Um, and the cover looks like a legal pad with notes scrawled on it. and. Um, but down at the bottom here, in all caps, it says, it's all about the patients. I know I'm going to be the first skeptic ever to say this, but I suddenly take great comfort in knowing how Galileo's trial turned out. Thank you. Bob Blaskowitz. Thank you, Robert.